The shores of Lake Superior in Michigan are home to glowing uperlite rocks, a natural phenomenon of cyanite rocks rich with fluorescent soda light minerals. These rocks glow under ultraviolet light, providing beautiful patterns inside and out. When they first found the rocks, they couldn't identify them as any existing type of rock. Although they've been mainly obtained from Lake Superior, their origin story takes them back millions of years. They formed from thick continental crustal areas of Canada. They then slowly followed the continental ice sheets, along with the glaciers, some thousands of years ago. Natural phenomena occur in many forms, and the only thing humankind has to do is admire their intrigue and beauty. Seeking the end of a rainbow has long been an opportunity to find a pot of hidden gold. This is an old tale that originates back to the time when Vikings buried their gold in Ireland. Philosophers and scholars had an understanding of how rainbows rationally formed even before then. Rainbows are an optical illusion, the result of refraction and reflection. This combo happens thanks to the spreading of white light through the water droplets at multiple angles, dispersing the white light into a continuous distribution of colors. Every rainbow you ever witness is a double one, though the second band isn't always visible, as more white light escapes being spread further apart. The light escapes upwards, as opposed to the primary bow, which is downwards. Some cultures believe the northern lights were created by a great fire fox running across the skies. Others, that it was created by the plumes of great whales. Many northern cultures were sure it's a sign positive news was on the way. How it occurs is still intriguing, just in a more scientific way rather than mythical. Great solar storms caused by the sun 93 million miles away send waves of charged solar particles into space in all directions. When the Earth crosses paths with one of these waves, the magnetic field and the atmosphere respond. As the charged particles from the sun strike atoms within Earth's atmosphere, electrons move to a higher energy state. Then, as they drop back to a lower energy form, they release light photons, creating the auroras on the north and south poles. Volcanoes are an exciting display of Mother Nature. They're formed when hot molten rock, ash, and gases escape from an opening on the Earth's surface. The molten rock and ash solidify as they cool, creating the volcano spout as it erupts further, pushing more ash into the sky. The naturally occurring phenomena from a volcano with the combination of lightning is a different spectacle altogether. When a volcano emits dense ash clouds close to the ground, it causes particles to rub together creating static electricity, which results in lightning strikes above the volcano. As the ash clouds rise higher towards the stratosphere, jostling ice particles can create great bolts of lightning. This combination is similar to how a thundercloud produces lightning. Thunderstorms normally form in the late afternoon, when the sun has heated the earth and atmosphere enough for the right environment. Warm, moist air rises into the cold air, causing condensation and sending cool airdrops of water into the atmosphere, where it warms and rises again. A supercell thunderstorm is likely to further transform into a tornado. It happens as the warm air rises through the colder air, causing an updraft, and rotates with fast winds blowing in different directions. As more warm air is drawn and the rotation increases, cool air in the jet stream with strong winds in the atmosphere provides further energy to feed on. The moist air forms a funnel cloud that grows, descending to the ground and spawning a tornado. The USA has the most tornadoes in the world, around 1,200 per year. They're also some of the most destructive and far greater in size than anywhere else. They're especially bad in the so-called tornado alley, with mid-level dry air coming from the Rockies, along with cold air approaching from the northern half of the continent. The fallen civilization of Atlantis has been a popular myth romanced by science fiction and other beliefs. Many locations have been theorized for its true location. One of its many supposed whereabouts has been the blue eye of the Sahara, or the reshot structure. Although it's an interesting notion, this geological formation had built up over the course of millions of years. Volcanic activity initially lifted the entire landscape from around the eye, and, over time, eroded and collapsed upon itself. Eventually, it formed onion-like layers of rock and the great eye that can be seen while flying above. 
Apart from being a marvelous site, there isn't anything solid to claim Atlanteans actually resided there. There are several locations around the world with pink lakes. This unique color is a product of the right amount of sunlight and heat in a body of water with large salt content. Only specific microbes can withstand such extreme conditions. They produce and collect carotenoids. The carotenoids are a class of plant chemicals found in cells of vegetation to help absorb sunlight. As the microbes help create the pink algae, brine shrimp feeding on the algae also turn pink, as do flamingos' feathers as they feed on the shrimp and algae. For decades, the mystery of sailing stones in the desert has had people stumped. Some rocks as heavy as a human would somehow move across the sand, leaving a long trail behind them. Yet, when observed, the rocks were completely motionless. It wasn't until advanced technology used to monitor their movements found that this wasn't some elaborate prank, and the stones didn't have a mind of their own. They found during winter that melting ice panels would allow the stones to move in all directions with the assistance of light winds. The rocks can travel up to 16 feet per minute. The Christmas Island Crab is part of an amazing phenomenon once a year. Their migration period is determined by the phase of the moon and the first rainfall between October and February, although the precise date can't be predicted. Once the crabs have been prompted, they leave their homes amongst the forest and migrate in massive hordes towards the sea. Numbering in millions, a sea of red crabs is observed as they make their journey across the island, creating roadblocks and making their way to the ocean. There, they lay their eggs and then make their trek back returning to the forest until the next year. Crop circles are a popular hoax on land, but underwater, they occur naturally without the intent to try and trick people. Male pufferfish spend seven to nine continuous days laboriously making intricate patterns in fine sands, hoping for a female to approach and inspect their artwork. Unfortunately, the complicated patterns aren't maintained once the purpose is fulfilled. They soon fade away after being made, making their discoveries by humans rare. One could imagine the first diver's reaction as they came across these weird patterns. Deserts aren't the most likely of places for flowers to grow, but they share a similar rose that grows in each of them all around the world. The desert rose doesn't grow biologically, but is formed from crystal clusters made from gypsum or barite. These crystals form a circular series of flat plates that give the rock a similar shape to a rose petal. The texture and sizes can vary depending on which desert they're from and the type of sands that are in the surrounding environment. Bioluminescence, which is the production and emission of light by a living organism, is a phenomenon that many species on Earth share. Algae create an ethereal glow in the ocean during the night. These tiny marine organisms glow with the smooth movements of the waves, commonly noticed on the shores of beaches. The light is activated from movement. In massive groups, they appear like stars, twinkling in their millions. Animals that have the ability of illumination use it in different ways within their unique environments. Jellyfish floating ominously in the depths emit a glow as a warning towards would-be predators. Tiny bacteria, only visible under a microscope, use their light as a form of communication. Deep sea fish, like the anglerfish, use a light at the end of their head as bait to mimic smaller fish and lure them towards them. Fireflies glow at night to attract potential mates, and click beetles emit an orange light upon being disturbed, using it as a defense mechanism. Back in May 2015, David Hull took his metal detector and went looking for gold. He picked the perfect spot for it. Mayborough near Melbourne, Australia, was the top location down under during the gold rush in the 19th century. The detector beeped, showing there was something precious hiding in the ground. David found a very heavy reddish rock with a weird, dimpled surface resting in some yellow clay. As it turned out later, the find was indeed priceless, but only for science. David took the rock home, hoping he'd be able to open it and find a gold nugget inside. He tried a rock saw, an angle grinder, and a drill, and put the rock in acid. Nothing worked. Not even a sledgehammer did the job. A couple of years later, he decided to take the rock to Melbourne Museum and finally find out what it really was. 
It turned out it was a meteorite, and a rare one. The geologist working at the museum was over the moon, as after years of looking at thousands of rocks that people had thought to be meteorites, he finally got his hands on the real thing. The space origin of the rock explained why it was so unusually heavy. It contained dense forms of iron and nickel, and those guys weigh a lot. And it got its dimpled surface because it started melting when it plunged through Earth's atmosphere. Scientists named the meteorite Maribro after the place where it was found and used a diamond saw to study it better. They sliced off a sliver of the space rock and saw some tiny crystallized droplets of metallic minerals throughout it. Those minerals formed during the early years of our solar system. It means the space guest was around 4.6 billion years old. The researchers are still not quite sure where the meteorite came from or how long it's been on Earth, but they've got some guesses. Our solar system used to be a swirling mix of dust and chondrite rocks. Gravity did its thing and formed planets, but there were some leftovers, and most of them ended up in a massive asteroid belt. The Mabro meteorite likely took a detour from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It got bumped out of there by asteroids crashing into each other, and one fine day, it decided to crash into Earth. Carbon dating says that this space rock has been chilling on Earth for somewhere between 100 and 1,000 years. There were meteorite sightings in the 19th century that could match up with when it made its grand entrance. The scientists say the Maybro meteorite is even rarer than gold. It's only the 17th meteorite ever found in the Australian state of Victoria and the second largest. In the 80s, David Mazurik from Michigan decided to buy a farm not far from Mount Pleasant. The new property came with a weird bonus, a large rock that kept the barn door open. The farmer explained the rock was a meteorite. It had literally fallen from the sky in the 30s. The farmer and his father found the crater the meteorite had left and dug out their guest from space, which was still warm. They couldn't think of a better use for it than to serve as a doorstop. I mean, what else can you do with a meteorite? The new owner got to keep the unconventional doorstop and must have grown fond of it. When he was moving to a new home, he took the rock with him and used it for the same purpose for another 30 years. Sometimes David will let his kids take it to school. It must have gotten some easy A's in physics and astronomy. Then he heard that other Michigan residents find and sell pieces of meteorites for some serious cash. Since his piece was an impressive 22 pounds, he decided to take it to Central Michigan University to find out its value. A local geology professor was getting tired of similar requests because, for around 18 years, she had to explain to people all the rocks they had brought her weren't meteorites at all. But this time, she felt it was the real thing. She tested the rock and determined it was a meteorite made from iron and nickel. It turned out to be the sixth largest recorded find of this kind in Michigan, and the most valuable specimen she's ever worked with. They sent a slice for another round of verification to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and soon it was all official. It turned out that the meteorite was a piece of an early solar system. The Smithsonian and a museum in Maine offered some good money for the space rock. Mazurik decided to sell his meteorite to Michigan State University's Abrams Planetarium for $75,000. He generously shared 10% of the money with Central Michigan University's Earth and Atmospheric Sciences Department, where they confirmed the rock's true identity. I hope the money he was left with was enough to buy a new doorstop. While some use meteorites as furniture, scientists have found a way to utilize them to extract oxygen from water on Mars. Traveling to the Red Planet is impossible without oxygen. We need it both to breathe and fuel rockets for a return trip to Earth. The new robot, called AI Chemist, hunts down a compound that can kickstart a chemical reaction on Mars to produce oxygen. The compound is crafted from elements found in Martian meteorites. This planet only has traces of oxygen in its atmosphere. 
But scientists have found there's some liquid water underneath the southern ice cap of Mars and more water under its surface. So they needed to figure out how to break down this water into its hydrogen and oxygen molecules using materials available on the red planet. The AI chemist analyzed five meteorites that either came from Mars or were similar to that of its surface. It used a laser to locate large amounts of iron, nickel, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, and manganese in the samples. These elements will be enough to produce more than 3.7 million possible molecules to break down water and generate oxygen on the red planet. Finding the right algorithm for this process would take us humans around 2,000 years, and the robot managed to do it in a matter of weeks. Using the meteorite compound as a catalyst, the robot managed to do its job in negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit on Earth. And it did so without any human help at all. Now the question is, if it will be able to do the same on Mars, where the atmospheric composition, air density, humidity, gravity, and other conditions are trickier than on Earth. Other scientists previously managed to produce small amounts of oxygen fit for breathing up there. An instrument the size of a lunchbox on NASA's Perseverance rover compressed and heated carbon dioxide from Mars's atmosphere. It generated oxygen at around the same speed as a small tree. I think Matt Damon's character from The Martian would have loved all these advances in space science. Thousands of meteorites crash into our planet every year. 95% of them are thought to come from just two sources. 75% from the crust of a big asteroid, and 20% from the mantle of an even larger celestial body that bit the dust ages ago. But in May 2020, researchers stumbled upon some meteorite pieces in the Sahara Desert that were like nothing they'd seen before. They were labeled as ungrouped achondrites a type of rock that formed from melted minor planets way back in the solar system's early days. This makes the find slightly older than Earth itself. But unlike others of its kind, this meteorite was made out of andesite, which made it even more unique. It could serve as proof that the early protoplanets in the solar system and a ton of other debris either got wrecked or joined forces in building the rocky planets we know today. On August 2, 1996, huge, mysterious patterns appeared on an agricultural field in Chiseldon, England. No one knew what kinds of symbols those were and who left them. As soon as the local news reported this, people immediately began to make their guesses. The most popular version was a message from a civilization living on another planet. The first crop circles appeared in the 70s in many areas across the U.S. and England. Some compared these symbols to the writings of the ancient Maya. Others thought those were messages about the approaching apocalypse. But few doubted that their authors were from another civilization. But that geometric pattern in Chiseldon was different from all the others because of an event that happened eight years later. In 2004, a man from New Mexico found a strange stone 11 miles from Roswell. The rock had the same pattern on it as the crop circle in Chiseldon. It's worth noting that Roswell became a famous place after, according to rumors and legends, a spaceship from another planet crashed there. Therefore, when the farmer found the stone and posted its photo on the internet, many people thought it was part of that spaceship. The stone was perfectly smooth, and the pattern was applied with incredible precision. But the most remarkable thing was its magnetic properties. It rotated counterclockwise when people put the magnet next to its northern part. When they left the magnet near the southern side, the stone turned in the other direction. Computed tomography and x-rays showed that there hadn't been any elements inside the stone that could cause rotation. It was just a smooth piece of rock. But was the Roswell rock really part of a spaceship? To answer this question, we need to move to England, the year 1976. An artist named Doug Bauer met his friend Dave Corley and invited him to create an impressive performance. At that time, people only learned about strange patterns in the fields from some books and records. And of course, none of these cases had been confirmed. 
the two friends understood that all this was nothing more than myths. Therefore, they decided to draw a big pattern in a wheat field in Wiltshire. Now, they didn't expect this drawing to become so popular. Many newspapers began to write about mysterious circles. Hundreds of reporters filmed it on their cameras, and people watching TV were sh- Gibbs noticed the manuscript contained Latin abbreviations often used in medieval medical papers and reference books. Gibbs even found out that the book was a plagiarism of other older medical reference works. He compared the Voynich manuscript with other Latin books and found many similar words. Gibbs claimed that the manuscript was dedicated to women's health, and the mysterious flowers were real herbs and plants. But it wasn't that simple. Nicholas Gibbs was one of many who put forward the theory. Many scientists recognized his version as banal and unconvincing. Other decoders claimed that some secret code was used in the manuscript. Some were sure it was written by Dominican nuns. Others described it as a reference book on astrology and herbs. Anyway, you can find scans of the manuscript in high resolution on the internet and try to crack the code yourself. Imagine that you're walking around New York and entering a dark, deserted alley. Then you see some canvas with a beautiful picture on it lying in a trash can. You don't really understand what exactly is depicted there, but you still feel some power of art emanating from it. You take the painting home and hang it on the wall. It's been hanging there almost four years. Then you publish a photo with the painting on the website with antiques and discover that this picture is a missing masterpiece worth $1 million. This is a real story that happened to a New Yorker in 2003. Famous Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo painted this picture called Three People in 1970. One collector bought it as a gift for his wife. But in 1989, someone stole the work while they were moving to a new house. It was possible that the thief didn't appreciate this piece of art or couldn't find a buyer, so they threw it into the nearest trash can. The woman who found it returned the work to the owner and received a $15,000 reward. Expensive paintings often end up in trash cans. Van Gogh gave his works to various people, but they didn't take them seriously at that time. When these paintings were found many years later, they were estimated at tens of millions of dollars. For example, the artist gave his doctor his portrait. The doctor was horrified by the painting. Perhaps he didn't like the red shade of the hair. He gave the portrait to his mother, and she found a use for it. She covered the hole in her chicken coop with the picture. For more than 10 years, chickens had been running under the work of art. Then another artist found the painting. He paid the doctor pennies for it. Now it's estimated at $50 million. A similar case with a discarded work of art occurred in Italy. A gardener who worked at the Ricci Adi Gallery of Modern Art was removing ivy from the building's walls and found a rusty metal door in the thicket. He opened it and got into a dark room. There was a garbage bag lying there. The gardener wanted to throw it in the trash but decided to look inside first. 
And he found the lost work of famous artist Gustav Klimt. During the renovation of the gallery in 1997, someone stole the painting, Portrait of a Lady. It turned out that the thief had never taken it out of the building. Its value is estimated at $66 million. In 1901, collectors of sea sponges discovered a mysterious chest in the sea near Greece. There was a strange object inside, similar to a mechanical watch and the size of a shoebox. The finding attracted the attention of archaeologists. They quickly established that this item was created in ancient Greece about 2,200 years ago. They called it the Antikythera mechanism. Now it's in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Scientists have found out that this object is only 82 fragments, one-third of the original mechanism. It's still unknown who created it and how it works. But experts think it was a mechanical computer with bronze gears and other parts. People use it for astronomical calculations. The device could track the movements of the Sun, the Moon, and five planets of the solar system. Experts are still trying to figure out all the properties of this machine. It's considered to be the oldest computer on Earth. It proves that the level of technology 2,000 years ago was much higher than we could imagine.